and taking pictures just to get like the details of like the you know the clothes and the food and all figured out but the more big picture stuff about like the economy of this world and the social structures um, that was very much researching some of I mean you know, our own American history so researching we had this reconstruction era convict leasing um, you know, when debt slavery, that kind of comes into play in a big way in this world. Um, looking, of course, at chattel slavery, um, just the different ways different kinds of women were oppressed. Um, so yeah, just trying to like build a world that felt familiar to our world and deconstruct some of these issues. It was really cool. Um, and I'll be honest, fantasy isn't always my favorite genre. And I think one of the reasons is because if I have to read a lot of explanations, a lot of description, all at the beginning, I sort of tune out, and then later on, I'm totally lost because I missed something that was totally <laughs> essential to the story, but of course I had tuned it out. Um, so one of the things I loved about this book is just how organically you built the world. You know, I sort of felt like I slipped into Arcata and I could see it and feel it and understood the social organization and how things work. Could you talk, I don't know, just a little bit about this process of world building for you? Did you have it? sort of set out in your head when you started writing or? Yeah, um, so I always say world building is my favorite part. Um, like I would be happy just like writing a brochure for a fantasy <laughs> world like with no plot at all. Um, Visit arcata.com. Yeah, exactly. I don't, no, you don't know if you want to go there. But <laughs> yeah, so I kind of, I, I look at world building in the same way as character building in that you kind of have to ask some deeper questions. I think it's, really instinctive to kind of look at the superficial stuff, like what do these people wear, you know, what do they like to eat? But, you know, if you're talking about a person, that doesn't really give you a big idea of, of who they are. So you kind of have to think a little deeper, like, okay, what are they most proud of in this world? What are they most afraid of? Um, what are their views on death? You know, are they, do they get into fights quickly or not? Like, it's kind of like building a culture um, in the same way you would build a character. It was really helpful. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I was really struck by the idea, I mean, so there were so, so many clear parallels between sort of historical oppression in the United States, but then you had the social organization, social status was determined by whether or not someone had a shadow. Could you talk yeah. about, like, just, that was such an awesome way of framing it. I wonder, I'm hoping you Yeah, um, so there, the reason for that was, um, growing up, I was always really tired of reading books about racism. Um, you know, I, I kind of see them as like, your vegetables and that they're important and you need to eat them. But um, it didn't feel fair that I only had vegetables when other kids got to have like cake as well. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna try and have it both ways with this. I really do wanna talk about these deeper issues, but I also don't want it to be traumatizing for readers and I want them to have a lot of fun with it. So that's why we decided to use um, a fantasy element for the, the kind of the caste system. I didn't want to have any actual like anti-blackness or other kind of real world racism in here. In this case, it's based off this fantasy element about whether or not you have a shadow. Um, but you can see the parallels for sure. Yeah, the parallels are definitely there. But, and you know, you're tackling some really, uh, very heavy social issues, right? Like racism, economic stratification, traumatic memory, and PTSD, and sex trafficking, and all these things. But at the same time, I really felt like the bulk of the story was these girls, you know, reclaiming their power and yeah. you know, it wasn't it wasn't trauma for the sake of traumatizing. It was, you know, it was how they were coming out of that. Yeah, that was very important to me um, because people do compare it to The Handmaid's Tale, I guess, and that we're trying to write this very feminist um, story. But um, it's the kind of thing where I actually like can't watch or read The Handmaid's Tale anymore. It's it's a little too dark and a little too real. Um, so I wanted to focus, you know. I didn't want to necessarily portray the trauma, but focus more on how the girls are reacting to it and how they're overcoming it. Um, and like you said, focusing on their wins. So they have these wins. Like big ones, like yeah. fun. Yeah, it should I be fun. It's not a spoiler if there's a bank robbery in there, right? No, the bank robbery was, yeah, that was my favorite part. The bank robbery was really fun. <laughs> we I added that um, a little later, and my editor was like, there's no time to add this. And I was just like, no, we need, you can't have a Western without. Well, thank you, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, but it was, I mean, that was the thing. It was so fun to read, you know, these hijinks that they were getting into while at the same time, you know, 
also fighting back against this largely oppressive right. system. Um, so that's actually, I'm glad that you brought that up at the bank, Robert, in the editing process, because I was really curious as I read this, um, just how, when you were developing the story and the characters, they're so rich, like, and everybody has their thing, you know, there's a medic, a fighter, and a protector, but then as they go on this journey, you're peeling back the layers to see that they're actually much more than that, and their stories are a lot more complex. Violet, oh my gosh, way more complex. Um, but so when you started writing, did you have ideas of who these characters were in, in mind, or did they sort of develop alongside the story with you? I definitely think they developed alongside the story, because at first they really were just defined by whatever their thing was, because I was thinking to myself, okay, we just need to focus on practically what kind of people would be most useful in this journey. Um, and then I just had to think to myself, okay, well, how would somebody, you know, like how Tansy is the medic, it's like how would somebody gain medical skills growing up like she did? That seems like a very weird kind of circumstance, so I had to figure that out. Um, and similarly with Violet, I was like, okay, she's, at first she's just sort of there to be this annoying, like, you know, she's just like, the wrench in the works because nobody likes her, um, but they have to have her tagging along. Um, so I was trying to figure out, like, okay, well, what's this deeper issue? Why is she the way she is? And it kind of explored, you know, she's a little bit more privileged than the rest of them, and she uses that um, in a way that's very toxic, but you know, it's because she herself is also a victim, just not sure how to approach it. Yeah, it's another way for her to survive. Right. I also like that even after she sort of had these breakthrough moments with Aster, she still maintained her attitude. She was still sort of, She's know, still kind of, still snotty, right. still kind of sarcastic, I like that. She's messy. Yeah, that was nice. <laughs> um, and then Aster, I really liked, um, or something that just really stood out to me and struck me was the way that she wrestled with her anger throughout the whole book and how it started off and felt like this was something that she was fearing and trying to suppress and then sort of learned to harness it and use it. And yeah. It. Because she was right to yeah. be angry. Like she recognized the validity of it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Was that deliberate? Yeah, that was, um, that was really important to me. I feel like we have this stereotype of the angry black woman um, and this sort of the thing to come out of that is that we, we assume that people don't have the right to be angry, like that they are making a big deal out of nothing, or that they're always angry, so we just can't take them seriously. And it's like you said, yes, yeah, like, this anger is valid. Um, and it's the kind of thing where we should let women be angry, and we should let them um, express that anger and not feel guilty for it, because I think a lot of times we try to make people feel bad about their anger and feel like it's you know, a flaw, but you know, men are allowed to be angry. And, Time. Right, and it's, it's seen as a good thing. So it's just like, okay, well, let's let these girls be angry. Yeah, watch them win. Right. Um, so along those same lines, because I think actually just in and of itself, having Good Luck Girls feature this cast of characters we don't normally get to see in these roles, that in and of itself feels just really significant for young readers for me. But I was wondering, I mean, I took lots of messages away. I was reading this, I'm highlighting, I'm annotating, I'm like, yes, this is, you know, you could use this with students or with children to help them explore blah, 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 critical issue, and we can do that. But was there a particular message or lesson that you were hoping, like some sort of work that you were hoping beyond just sort of the representational issue? Yeah, I guess, um, so for sure, I did want to teach that message that like, your anger is valid and learn how to use it rather than letting it use you. Um, I want to sort of teach the message that self-defense is not violence, because we do have this sort of toxic messaging that's like, okay, well, if somebody is abusing you, then you're just as bad as them if you try to fight back. Um, and I didn't, want to, I didn't want to have that kind of message. I want to be like, you are allowed to defend yourself um, and claim your rights. Um, and I just wanted people to kind of understand these deeper structural issues and understand the way that different under, um, different minority groups are pitted against each other so that they can't come together. So in this case, I mean, there are the, the men, the dust blood men who are, um, you know, they do have some privilege over the women and they, they that, that's why they don't quite want to work with them at first. Um, and like I said, Violet has a little bit more privilege than the other girls, so she's kind of, there's some fracturing there. Um, but this is all very intentional by the people in power to keep these people from coming together. Yeah, they're sort of cultivating that mistrust. Right. And the stereotypes about each other. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm going to totally switch gears. Okay. okay. Um, so whenever I read a book that's been made into a movie, then me and my friends like to go and talk about, you know, what 
what's been changed, what looked just like we imagined in our heads, how they're depicting things, you know, what was cut from mm -hmm. the movie that we loved in the book, et cetera. So I know a lot of authors get asked, you know, who's your dream cast? <laughs> and I totally want to know that too. <laughs> but what I really want to know is, um, let's say your amazing book is adapted into a movie or a Netflix series. Is there anything that you feel really strongly just cannot, it has to remain, it can't be cut, it has to, you know, that you feel oh. really strong about keeping? That's a good question. I haven't thought about that. Um, I mean, I definitely want to make sure that they, they do have Aster and Clementine, that they do cast some black girls, because that was important to me. Um, like, you're thinking more like scenes. I don't know, I'm thinking anything. Hmm. Although I, mean, I think that's a really good point, because yeah. Hollywood casting is... You might have to I mean, we did it. have. It's really um, clear in the book, but that's not always. Well, the Mexican policy. cover had a white girl on the front. We were like, we wanted an like an ambiguous girl, and I was like, this is not ambiguous though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Now it's just a flower. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, I guess I would want to make sure that maybe just with the way they. Approach, I wouldn't want them, like I said, to kind of like marinate in the trauma and the suffering. I wouldn't want them to try and like shock people because um, it really isn't supposed to be about that. It's supposed to be about them winning, so. What about the sort of budding romances that, yeah. are, that you see? Um, you know, I, I feel like it's, there's a potential, I don't want to spoil this, there's a potential for Z to become this sort of romantic hero, mm -hmm. perhaps. But then I also think there's another romance that also could be celebrated as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I, I would feel pretty strongly about keeping both of those then. I not, think so. One. Yeah, so romance is definitely not like the focus of this book, but it, both of them are important because, um, you know, Aster has obviously these very conflicted feelings um, towards men especially, so she's not really sure when Z kind of comes in and starts showing interest in her sister, which is like not too much of a spoiler, I feel like. Um, I guess not. <laughs> yeah, maybe, but yeah, so she's not about it at all, so it's about her learning to kind of recognize that people can be worthy of her trust, um, and just kind of learning to, to see that there is positive romance, and not just what she's been experiencing till now. I think so. Okay, so Mal, I don't want to spoil it, but I never know where the spoiler line is. <laughs> so don't come at me with pitchforks. But Mal and Tansy's romance, though, I feel like it's just very healthy and beautiful from the beginning. Yeah. You know, there's not like a learning to trust or a learning yeah. to trust. It's just naturally. Well, and that kind of goes back to me wonderful. just wanting to have fun, because again, yeah. the same way like the black books were always sad, you know, the queer books were always sad. So yeah. I really wanted them to just there's not really have any conflicts. You know? yeah, yeah. They just get to be in love. Right. They kind of enjoy each other, which I thought was super great. Yeah. So fun. Um, okay. So a lot of my students who've read your book wanted me to ask you about just your process of becoming a published author mm -hmm. and you know, what it was like to, to write this book, um, how you became published, or even just, I don't know, the editing process of what yeah. things that were cut, you know, anything along those lines. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I feel like I owe a lot to the MFA program I went to. Um, I went to the new school in New York, um, and they have a program specifically for writing for children. And I just made a lot of really great connections. So, you know, a lot of my classmates are writing as well now. Um, and, you know, my thesis advisor put me in touch with the editors for this book. So she really just, because she knew people were looking for this. Um, so just like finding those connections was really valuable. Um, and having work to publishing myself with just kind of internship and assistance levels was really helpful in learning just what they're looking for and how to build a good query letter and, you know, who likes what kind of books. Um, so yeah, just like being in New York and seeing everything was very helpful. Was this the first book that you wrote or? No, not at all. Um, there's like six before this. That, yeah, but they were all valuable. There's like little bits and pieces of world building from old books that ended up in this one. And I feel like my craft just improved every time. So it was worth it. And so I'm guessing you can't tell us too much about the sequel yet. No. But I, but has, Publishing this first book then maybe changed your process at all for writing the sequel, or? Yeah, um, you know, when I'm writing, you know, before now, I was able to be very perfectionist, and because there wasn't a deadline, so I could just take my time and write things at my own pace. Uh, but with this, is very different, so 
I kind of had to learn how to let some of that go and just recognize that they, that they know it's going to be messy. They know it's going to be a messy first draft, and that's okay. And that's the most important thing is just to get the words down um, and recognize that you know it's their job to help you. So just you know, don't beat yourself up about it too much. Yeah. You mentioned adding in the bank robbery. Was yeah. there anything that was edited out of the original version that? Um, no, we mostly just made it, because again, this was like the kind of thing where I was not used to writing this fast, so the first draft was really short, um, and the second draft was mostly just adding things. Um, yeah, I don't think we took out anything major, like no major characters or anything. Um, are we doing okay on time? Yeah, we're fine, and then okay. you could just um, we'll take questions from the audience. Okay. Or what are I have one like very important question, okay. which is, because uh, I teach children's literature. Yes. So, what was your favorite book, or what were some of your favorite books that you read as a child? Okay, um, I always say Holes was hugely, oh, yes, because um, I was in sixth grade, I think, when I read it, and like, my sixth grade teacher is here, so I'm really excited. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it was such a well-crafted book, it was the first time I really recognized, it's like, oh, this is a the author actually like put some real hard work into this, and I kind of recognized that this was a job that I would really love to do. Um, and then, yeah, as I got older, I mean, of course, I loved Harry Potter. Um, What's your house? Hufflepuff. Yeah. It is. <laughs> yeah. Um, people, yeah, like I said, people mentioned The Handmaid's Tale, but my favorite Margaret Atwood book is Cat's Eye. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I like reading all kinds of stuff. I find reading more poetry now. Um, yeah, just like broaden my taste a bit. Well, I have a thousand questions, but I know people here, I'm sure, have lots of questions of their own as well. So maybe we could open it up to questions from the audience. Yes. Oh, that actually like my, was my editor's idea, and like she came up with it very quickly, and we stuck with it the whole time. So I'm really grateful because I'm not good at titles. So. <laughs> It's good when other people have ideas. Oh, there's some, um, so thinking about the process and the support that you had and possibly parents with aspiring authors in their mm -hmm. families, what what kind of family support and encouragement is helpful? <laughs> 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 This is not against plan. <laughs> but yeah, I really am grateful because, um, you know, going out to New York to do the MFA was very much a risk. We didn't have any idea if it was going to pay off. Um, and I'm just really glad that my family was very supportive of that decision and, you know, were just willing to kind of help me, you know, make that decision in the first place because I wasn't sure myself if it was going to be, um, if I should do it. Yeah, I, yeah, I do think it's. matter of you know treating it like a valid thing which is like a larger issue just with our culture like we don't necessarily treat the arts as valid um, but just being like okay yeah there really is you know there are a lot of people who are in the arts it's like why not you kind of just giving people the benefit of the doubt um, there's lots of other people who will kind of kick you down so hopefully just not the people at home <laughs> you always a writer that's something that was always a part of your yeah I always liked it yeah <laughs> Supported by your sixth grade teacher. Yes. <laughs> she was a writer. And she was so, so creative. I love all of her products. <laughs> 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 Another question? Yes. So, how do you think having a book like this around would have changed? The way oh, that's a good question. I feel like that's the motivation for writing for kids at all, is just trying to like, fill the gaps that you didn't have as a kid. I definitely would have liked, like I said, to have a book where 
the queer stuff and you know the black girls were not suffering for their identity. Um, I think that would have been really hugely helpful and just to see it on the page at all because it just wasn't even there um, a lot of the times. Um, and yeah, just seeing some positive representations of different kinds of ways to be strong, I thought that was important in writing this because we have girls who are, you know, like Mallow's like actually physically strong, she's the fighter, but then you have, you know, we've got a really smart one, we've got people who are compassionate, Violet's just really manipulative, which is strong in its own way. <laughs> so I'm just like trying to have different, you know, I want everybody to be able to kind of see themselves in it. Yes? I'm so curious what 15-year-old or 10-year-old you would be thinking right now. Oh, this is like beyond. <laughs> I don't think I even really like let myself quite because I was like, well, I'll just write on the side. I'll, I was like, I'll do something else. I think like 10 year old me still thought maybe I could go into the sciences, which was immediately, like the 15 year old me got to biology class and it didn't pan out. But um, yeah, it was, it was always kind of there. And I think, you know, it's the kind of thing where I would, would imagine this kind of thing, but not at all thinking would ever happen. So I'm just like very grateful to be here. Uh, I've only really thought about Aster, so there's this great dystopia on Netflix called 3%. It's like Brazilian, so I don't know if this actor even speaks English, but um, there's a character named Joanna who like, looks like Aster. She has the same kind of attitude, so I feel like that would be my ideal pick. That'd be very cool. Yes. So if there are no other questions, uh, I think we'll move on to the next part, which is mingling, and Charlotte is going to be signing Yeah, up. you can feel free to like ask me stuff one-on-one. -on -one. I'm, I'm here, yeah. And I think um, the library was doing well. Yeah, she's got a, a raffle. Oh, 